be sure to follow my ministry on BitChute and Rumble because this channel could disappear any day. Also, if you haven't already, subscribe to my YouTube backup channel. Links are in the description box and in my pinned comment below. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963. Thank you all so much for your prayers and support. God bless. Welcome to the Watchman channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. I want to turn overseas now to the Middle East. Iran and the United States locked in a face-off over the Iranian nuclear deal, and Israel is caught in the middle. How did Iran raise the stakes over the weekend? And how could this deadly stalemate reverberate throughout the Middle East? Chris Mitchell explains from Israel's northern border. Sunday, the head of the UN nuclear watchdog announced Iran will provide less access to its atomic program. The move is a response to U.S. refusal to lift sanctions, which Iran is demanding as a condition to return to the negotiating table. Some warn if negotiations lead to sanctions relief, it would begin a financial chain reaction in the region. If more money would go to the IRGC, to the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, it would mean more money for Hezbollah in Lebanon, more money for Hezbollah in Syria, or the uh, other uh, proxies of Iran in Syria, in Yemen, in Iraq, and more instability in general to the Middle East. You're already seeing Iran show tremendous aggression. It is increasing rapidly its enrichment of uh, uranium now to high level enrichment to, you know, very, very close to bomb making capacity. Middle East observer Joel Rosenberg fears negotiations could force Israel to strike first. That with Biden trying to get back into the nuclear deal, Israel might decide it has to take preemptive military action against Iran's nuclear facilities. And then what would be Iran's counterpunch? Almost certainly it would be by ordering the Hezbollah military to fire its 150,000 or so missiles and rockets here at Israel, which would be devastating. A war of words has already begun on Israel's northern border. Israel's Defense Minister Benny Gantz declared Lebanon's ground would tremble if Hezbollah attacked, while Hezbollah Chief Hassan Nasrallah boasted his military can hit anywhere in Israel, and that Israel would not see anything like it since the founding of the state. Just days ago, Israel's Air Force launched an exercise that simulated 3,000 strikes on Hezbollah targets within 24 hours. That's a great capability, and it's a message to Hezbollah. We know where you are, and we will get you. Israel's military predicted in 2021 that Hezbollah does not want to enter into a full-scale war. But in 2006, the second Lebanon war began with a small ambush. So they know anything could happen here on the Israeli-Lebanese border. Here in the north, every small match can uh, fuel a huge explosion. In the last days, the prophet Zechariah tells us Israel will be the focal point of world conflict, and he gives a dire warning to the nations who would dare come against Jerusalem. Zechariah 12, 2 and 3. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces, though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. Zechariah goes on to tell us in verse 6 that God will use the Israeli defense forces to destroy the Muslim nations that seek their destruction. 
In that day I will make the governors of Judah like a fire pan in the woodpile, and like a fiery torch in the sheaves. They shall devour all the surrounding peoples on the right hand and on the left. But Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, Jerusalem. As we continue to watch the Muslim world unite against Israel, the Bible tells us there are four possible prophecies on the verge of finding fulfillment. Isaiah 17.1, in which Damascus, Syria will be destroyed in a single night. Jeremiah 49, the prophecy of Alam, which could infer an Israeli attack upon Iran's nuclear program. Psalm 83, in which the Muslim nations that border Israel will mount an attack on Israel in order to cut them off from being a nation. Ezekiel 38 and 39, known as the War of Gog and Magog. In this prophecy, a coalition of nations led by Russia, Iran, and Turkey will attack Israel in the last days in order to take Israel's wealth. Isaiah 17, 1 and 14, the burden against Damascus. Behold, Damascus will cease from being a city, and it will be a ruinous heap. Then behold, at eventide, trouble, and before the morning, he is no more. This is the portion of those who plunder us, and the lot of those who rob us. Isaiah 17, 9, in that day his strong cities will be as a forsaken bow, and an uppermost branch, which they left because of the children of Israel, and there will be desolation. Isaiah 17, 1 and 14 tell us Damascus will be destroyed in a single night. Verse 9 suggests it is the children of Israel who caused this desolation, possibly with a nuclear weapon. A long forgotten prophecy that has recently been rediscovered by Bill Salas may enlighten us about the fate of Iran's current nuclear aspirations as we read in Jeremiah 49, 34 through 39. The word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah the prophet against Elam in the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will break the bow of Elam, the foremost of their might. In this prophecy, Jeremiah predicts that Iran will suffer the fate of a broken bow, which might imply that the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps will be unable to launch scores of its missiles at its enemies. Additionally, he declares that Iran will be struck at the foremost place of its might, which today could infer an attack upon its nuclear program. One of Iran's most strategic and vulnerable nuclear targets is the Bushehr nuclear reactor, located in the heart of ancient Elam. Jeremiah continues in verses 36 and 37. Against Elam I will bring the four winds from the four quarters of heaven, and scatter them toward all those winds. There shall be no nations where the outcasts of Elam will not go. For I will cause Elam to be dismayed before their enemies, and before those who seek their life. I will bring disaster upon them, my fierce anger, says the Lord, and I will send the sword after them, until I have consumed them. Jeremiah informs that the attack upon the ancient territory of Elam will produce numerous refugees, perhaps even turning into a humanitarian crisis. Exiles will be dispersed worldwide as if being blown about by overpowering winds. In addition to the Lord, Iran has enemies in this prophecy. Israel seeks to prevent Iran from becoming a nuclear nation. Additionally, Jeremiah says that Iran has fiercely angered the Lord, and that provokes the Lord to cause a severe disaster inside of Iran. Perhaps this alludes to a nuclear disaster caused from a strike upon Iran's Boucher nuclear reactor. Jeremiah's last two verses present the exiles of Jeremiah 49:36 with great news. I will set my throne in Elam, and will destroy from there the king and the princes, says the Lord. But it shall come to pass in the latter days, I will bring back the captives of Elam, says the Lord. Iranians who accept Christ in advance of his second coming will be returned from global exile into the restored fortunes of their historic homeland in Elam. Moreover, Jerusalem and Elam are the only two earthly locations identified in scripture for the future establishment of the Lord's throne. As we get closer to the rapture, the tribulation, and the second coming of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit will reveal to students of Bible prophecy the relevance of additional overlooked prophecies concerning the end times. Is the prophecy of Elam one of those prophecies? There is a prophecy written by Asaph the seer that many end time teachers believe has yet to find fulfillment. In this prophecy, a confederation of Muslim nations have taken crafty counsel against the Jewish people in Israel in order to destroy them as we read in Psalm 83, 1-8. Do not keep silent, O God. Do not hold your peace and do not be still, O God. For behold, your enemies make a tumult, and those who hate you have lifted up their head. They have taken crafty counsel against your people and consulted together against your sheltered ones. They have said, Come, and let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel may be remembered no more. For they have consulted together with one consent. They form a confederacy against you. The tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites, Moab and the Hagrites, Gabal, Ammon and Amalek, Philistia with the inhabitants of Tyre, Assyria also has joined with them. They have helped the children of Lot. Ezekiel 38, 1-9 The word of the Lord came to me, 
Son of man, set your face toward Gog of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him, and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and I will turn you about and put hooks into your jaws, and I will bring you out and all your army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed in full armor, a great host, all of them with buckler and shield, wielding swords, Persia, Cush, and Put are with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all his hordes, Bethgarma from the uttermost parts of the north with all his hordes, many peoples are with you. Be ready and keep ready, you and all your hosts that are assembled about you, and be a guard for them. After many days you will be mustered. In the latter years you will go against the land that is restored from war, the land whose people were gathered from many peoples upon the mountains of Israel, which had been a continual waste. Its people were brought out from the peoples and now dwell securely, all of them. You will advance, coming on like a storm. You will be like a cloud covering the land, you and all your hordes, and many peoples with you. These are the modern day nations listed in Ezekiel 38 and 39 who will be mustered in the latter years to attack Israel, Russia, Iran, Turkey, Libya, Sudan, and Ethiopia. As we can see by recent events, stage setting for the War of Gog and Magog is taking place as Russia, Iran, and Turkey are forming a dangerous alliance at the doorstep of Israel's border. God tells us exactly what will happen to Iran, Russia, Turkey, and the many peoples with you when they attack Israel in Ezekiel 38, 18 through 23, and 39 to 7 and 8. And it will come to pass at the same time when God comes against the land of Israel, says the Lord God, that my fury will show in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath I have spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel, so that the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the field, all creeping things that creep on the earth, and all men who are on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. The mountains shall be thrown down, the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. I will call for a sword against Gog throughout all my mountains, says the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother, and I will bring him into judgment with pestilence and bloodshed. I will rain down on him, on his troops, and on the many peoples who are with him, flooding rain, great hailstones, fire, and brimstone. Thus I will magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations, then they shall know that I am the Lord. And I will turn thee back, and leave but the sixth part of thee, and will cause thee to come up from the north parts, and will bring thee upon the mountains of Israel. So I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them profane my holy name any more. Then the nation shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Surely it is coming, and it shall be done, says the Lord God. This is the day of which I have spoken. I've been informed by top-ranking military officials that Israel has been unable to launch even a single plane in defense. As I stand here, fighter planes are exploding in midair. They're crashing and falling to the ground without any explanation. And while no one can seem to give me any reason for why this is happening, I can tell you this. This all-out, unprecedented attempt to destroy Israel appears to be failing. God is the one who fights this battle for Israel. He does it for two reasons. To make his holy name known in the midst of his people Israel, that the nation shall know that he is the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Zechariah 2, 8, and 9. For thus says the Lord of hosts, He sent me after glory to the nations which plunder you. For he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. For surely I will shake my hand against them, and they shall become spoil for their servants then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. Israel is precious to Almighty God, the apple of his eye. He is simply saying, You touch my chosen nation Israel, you poke me in the eye. Is Vladimir Putin, the infamous Gog of Magog, that the prophet Ezekiel warned would come on the scene in the last days and lead a coalition of nations to destroy Israel? Or could Gog be Recep Tayyip Erdogan, another dictator, who is fast gaining power and dominance in the Middle East? Biblical scholars can't agree if the prophet Ezekiel was talking about a last day's assault on Israel being led by Russia or Turkey. Many popular Bible teachers claim that Gog will come from Russia, while others claim that Ezekiel's prophecy actually points to Turkey. Whether Gog is from Russia or Turkey, both nations are presently being led by undisputed dictators who could each very easily fit the Gog profile. Jakarta is the world's fastest sinking city. Every monsoon season is a reminder of the worsening crisis as large parts of the city are once again submerged. 
In Jakarta's east, thousands of people were moved to safety as floodwaters reached up to 1.8 metres high in some areas. Rescuers and police worked together to help people escape. The water in my home is still chest high. All my belongings got flooded. I tried to put them somewhere higher, but then last night the water also went higher. The Indonesian capital is home to about 10 million people and thousands are now without power. Many here are so accustomed to this recurring disaster, they choose to wait it out on balconies and roofs. Flooding is an annual event here in Jakarta. It's something that this community in East Jakarta is well accustomed to. But this year, many communities which have never experienced severe flooding before are doing so for the first time. And scientists say Jakarta's local government must act faster to save this sinking city. In the relatively affluent area of Kemang, people told Al Jazeera they have never experienced such severe flooding. Jakarta's governor, Anis Baswedan, says local authorities are working swiftly to assist everyone. Forced from their homes without their toys, it's not the first time these children have played in floodwaters and it likely won't be the last. As thousands of Indonesians are forced to leave their homes and belongings once again, many are asking what it will take for the authorities to act. Moving on to Texas now, the power is back on for most of the state, but millions of lives are still in turmoil. Broken water pipes and flooding mean huge insurance claims, possibly on an unprecedented scale. Many families also face skyrocketing electric bills and potential financial disaster as a result. Around NRG Stadium in Houston, food lines stretch for miles. These people hope for a lifeline of basic necessities. We're talking groceries, drinking water. Nearly 5,000 cars were served on Sunday alone. Janet Shamlian reports from Houston for us. Janet, a lot of these people never expected to be in a food line like that. Good morning to you. Tony, good morning to you, and many of them are very worried this morning. They've already been through this with Hurricane Harvey, and some of them are still battling with their insurance companies over settlements from that storm. And the price tag this time expected to be much larger. Where has Harvey impacted primarily the coast in cities like Houston? This storm did damage across a wide swath of Texas. I thought, oh, God, not again. I can't do this again. Tabitha Charlton was playing cards with her twin daughters last week when she heard a pipe burst. My ceiling just caved in in their bedroom. I don't know what to do. There was just water shooting out of the ceiling, just shooting down on everything. Now the song and dance with her insurance company, a process she's all too familiar with. Charlton's home also flooded during 2017's Hurricane Harvey. Those claims settled just 12 days ago. When this happened, I walked out my front door and I fell to my knees and I sobbed. Dealing with the insurance company is a nightmare. It is a nightmare. I can deal with the damage that could be fixed, but another three and a half year battle with the insurance company, I don't have it in me. The price tag for this storm could surpass Harvey's $19 billion in insurance losses. The problem many Texans are now facing, getting estimates for their damage. And there's no standardization across insurance policies. The Texas Department of Insurance suggests filing your claims as soon as possible, taking photos of damage, and waiting to make permanent repairs until speaking with the insurance company. Otherwise, they may not pay. How do you put a price tag on what I have spent in my time? As for Charlton, she says she agreed to receive less than half of the more than $300,000 she spent in Harvey repairs. And she still hasn't received a check. I was so close. And now it's all over again. You won't leave. I, I don't know what I'm going to do. I honestly don't. We just want our home to be our home and not have to walk through the house. And every time we see something, it's a reminder of years of grief and trauma and fighting. Tabitha Charlton's house is unlivable. For now, she and her twin daughters are staying with neighbors. So special presidential envoy John Kerry is sounding the alarm on climate change tonight, pronouncing that the world has only nine years left to avert a climate catastrophe. We are absolutely clearly, without question, now inside the decisive decade. Hundreds of millions of people will be forced from their homes, forced from their habitat. The Biden administration wants to get the U.S. to net zero emissions by 2050. The world is baffled at the events taking place in the weather, and yet it was foretold 2,000 years ago in Bible prophecy that this would happen. Satan, the great deceiver, often tries to front-run God by giving people wrong ideas ahead of time 
about what is prophesied to happen. Satan has tricked mankind into believing that climate change is real and in turn has blinded many people to the gospel of Jesus Christ, as we read in 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age is blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Jesus said a sign of his return would be more frequent and more intense weather, as we read in Matthew 24, 7 and 8. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Pestilence is the Greek word loimus, which means a plague. Definition of a plague is any large-scale calamity, especially when thought to be sent by God. God has used plagues in the form of extreme weather in the past and will again in the future. The seventh plague on Egypt was hail. Don't forget about the famine in Joseph's time. One of the biggest is the flood in the book of Genesis. In the future, during the seven-year tribulation, God will once again use extreme weather in the form of pestilence as judgment. In Revelation 16:21, God uses hailstones weighing 100 pounds each, and great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. In Revelation 16:8 and 9, God uses scorching heat. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire, and men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. Climate change is simply Satan's counter to Jesus' signs of his return and the end of the age. So when Jesus Christ warns us that just before his second coming, there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places, you had better believe that these occurrences are a sign from God and that he is about to intervene. Don't let Satan blind you to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The extreme weather the world has been witnessing is not climate change. It is God letting us know our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is returning. John 15, 18 through 20 If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Radical Islamic terrorists struck the African nation, the Democratic Republic of Congo, killing 16 people and burning down a church. The raid happened February 14th, when fighters linked to ISIS attacked the eastern part of the country. Human rights groups say the terrorists also destroyed a Catholic church in Ituri province. Islamic terrorists opened fire while entering the village, killing 13 civilians and three soldiers. The United Nations says more than 600 civilians have been killed in this province since May of 2020. CBN senior international correspondent George Thomas is here now with more. So, George, the U.N. says hundreds of civilians have been killed in this region, many of them Christians, I would imagine. Uh, that's absolutely correct. And why is that the case? It's because uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, also known as the DRC, uh, is two-thirds uh, Christian. The majority of them are Catholics. And in this particular part of, uh, of the DRC, uh, Ephraim, it's the northeastern part of the, uh, of the Congo. You look at that map uh, that you threw up there. Uh, you know, it borders uh, Rwanda, Uganda, uh, Burundi. And this particular region of the DRC has seen a lot of conflict, uh, partly because of the ethnic rivalries uh, that exist in this corner uh, of, of the country. Uh, but also, it is uh, mineral rich, the DRC, uh, is mineral rich on and some of the most uh, precious commodities, uh, minerals rather, that the world uh, requires from everything from what uh, makes your cell phone to car technology to satellite technology. Uh, the DRC is, uh, is uh, just filled with, with wealth. Uh, under under the ground. And so these places become uh, uh, conflict zones and areas become conflict zones as various groups uh, jockey for position and power. Tell us about these groups launching these horrific attacks and what's their agenda? Yeah, they are members of the Allied Democratic Forces, and they basically came into existence back in 1996 when I talked about these various ethnic groups that were fighting in the region, various militias banded together, uh, and uh, and they've uh, they've started um, you know launching attacks in this particular region. Uh, they have a very clear mission, and that is to attack, kidnap, 
uh, and kill Christians. They are part of an Islamist uh, agenda, Islamist ideology, an Islamic agenda. In fact, uh, ISIS. Uh, there, there's no uh, sort of official link with ISIS, but ISIS has claimed responsibility for their various attacks uh, in the Ituri uh, uh, province. In fact, the UN Secretary General uh, Antonio Guterres uh, said recently about the ADF, this particular group, that they are part of a network that starts all the way in Libya and stretches uh, to the Sahel and to the Lake Chad uh, region. In fact, ISIS has uh, declared the DRC as the Central Africa Republic uh, uh, affiliate uh, of ISIS. John 16, 1 through 3. These things I have spoken to you, that you should not be made to stumble. They will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. And these things they will do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. Service is the Greek word latria, which means ministration of God, i.e. worship. Muslims kill in the name of Allah, thinking they offer God worship. The Bible tells us they do it because they do not know the Father nor His Son, Jesus Christ. How is the church responding to what's happening there? Well, you know, as we have seen all around the world, where, where, where when people of faith, particularly Christians, suffer for their faith, uh, they rise up. And it is no different in, in the DRC, especially in the Turi uh, region. Uh, a bishop there, a prominent bishop, uh, sent the words to his community saying, listen, there are so many people who are hurting members, loved ones who have lost family members. And this is, after all, the Lent season, which runs all the way till uh, till." April, and they said, let's continue to show the goodness and mercy of Jesus Christ by reaching out to those who are suffering, by reaching out to our uh, our enemies, reaching out to those who uh, are in need, and showing the compassion and the love of Jesus Christ. It's a remarkable story that in the middle of their persecution, in the middle of their suffering, they continue to be the hands of Jesus Christ, not just in, uh, in, in uh, the DRC Congo, mm -hmm. but across the African continent, wherever People of faith, specifically Christians, suffer for their faith. Real quick, less than 30 seconds. It may come as a surprise that despite these attacks, the Christian church there is exploding. It absolutely, uh, it absolutely is. Africa is seeing the explosion of Christianity from the from the tip of the southern uh, of the of the continent all the way to the north. Uh, it's an incredible story. We've been documenting it on CBN News for many many years. It really is sort of the untold story that God is on the move on this beautiful continent. Jesus said as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, Christians would be persecuted as we read in Matthew 24, 9 and Luke 21, 12. Matthew 24, 9, Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Luke 21, 12, But before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons, you will be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. International pressure is mounting against China's communist government. Beijing received global criticism for its mishandling of the COVID-19 crisis. Now it's accused of launching a major crackdown against Christians. February 1st, 2021. Public security police storm onto the property of a government-sanctioned church in China's Wenzhou city. Their mission? Toppling a cross from the roof of a church building for a second time. They'd removed the cross seven years earlier, but church members replaced it. Bob Fu is with China Aid, a group that helps China's persecuted Christians. That city alone, we have documented over 1,600 churches with their crosses were being burnt, destroyed, and destructed. And many pastors, you know, were even detained, imprisoned. China's Christians say it's the worst persecution against them since Chairman Mao Zedong. To use ambassador. Uh, 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 Sam Brombeck's word uh, is a war against the faith. I think it's a war against the independent faith. And it's no longer limited to certain regions of China. VOM's Todd Nettleton says this massive wave of Christian persecution is widespread, and it's coming from the national government. What we say in 2021 is that everywhere in China, there is intense persecution of Christians. There is intense uh, efforts to control the church, to bring the church under Communist Party control. The crackdown is affecting every Christian in China, says Nettleton. Protestants, Catholics, government-registered churches, and unregistered house churches. 
And the Chinese Communist Party has a new excuse for targeting Christians. Now, under this the pretext of uh, COVID-19 coronavirus, uh, the Chinese Communist Party has intensified its persecution by banning all the church activities, even those services or worship uh, or prayer meetings in believers' own homes uh, with their own family members. July 22nd, 2020, a loud knock on the door at the home of a woman in China's Yemen city. She tells the police outside they cannot enter her home without a permit. Moments later, they destroy the lock and enter anyway, breaking up what the government says is an illegal meeting. Fu says it's all part of President Xi Jinping's campaign of sinicization, which means Christians are only considered to be good citizens if they adhere to communist ideology. Ironically, Xi Jinping's portrait was even put on the church pulpit along with the Chairman Mao. And uh, the first line uh, item of worship, um, uh, you know, uh, by the government sanctioned church before COVID-19 uh, was to sing the Communist Party's national anthem. And examples go beyond churches. In Fuzhou City, a Catholic family was forced out of their government subsidized housing after they refused to remove religious icons from their home. And China's Religious Affairs Bureau has banned religious funeral ceremonies and preaching in funeral places. Meanwhile, despite the suffering, Bob Fu is expressing optimism about the country's spiritual future. He says when the Communist Party seized government control in 1947, only about one million people in China claimed to be Christian. But today, after 70 years of unrelenting persecution, their numbers have grown to as many as 130 million. Matthew 5, 10 through 12. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Remember to pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters in Christ. Remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. Hebrews 13.3, 1 Corinthians 12.26 And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. 1 Corinthians 16.13 Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what? If his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning, my prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! The signs of Jesus soon return are so strong now and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with Him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive in faith the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in Him 
and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. Biblical repentance is changing your mind about Jesus Christ and turning to God in faith for salvation. Turning from sin is not the definition of repentance, but it is one of the results of genuine, faith-based repentance towards the Lord Jesus Christ. Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.